Welcome to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you're listening to a weekly podcast about books and life. Not necessarily in that order. You can subscribe to the Virtual Memories Show on iTunes, or use our RSS feed with your favorite podcatcher. You can find the RSS feed on our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. We're also on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and on Tumblr at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. You can support this podcast and get access to exclusive content with a recurring monthly donation via Patreon. Just visit patreon.com slash vmspod and set up your level of support. Every week you'll get new material from our patron-only blog, and you'll also get to listen to my monthly bonus podcast, Fear of a Square Planet, which features extra material from our guests and is only available to supporters of the show. So visit patreon.com slash vmspod and patronize me. Now, this week is the second of our Drew Friedman brokered episodes. Uh, last time we spoke with David Leopold, the archivist of Al Hirschfeld. And this time around, we have a conversation with comedy historian Cliff Nesteroff. Uh, Cliff's first book came out a few months ago, and it's called The Comedians, Drunks, Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy from Grove Press. It's an amazing book. It covers a hundred years of comedy from the, the days of vaudeville through the comedy podcast era, touching on everything in between uh, the rise of radio, then TV, the nightclub scene, the way those were dominated by the mob, the civil rights era. There's so much that he manages to encompass in about 400 pages. Um, Cliff's been writing articles about forgotten stories of comedy, mainly on uh, Beware of the Blog at WFMU.org for a whole bunch of years. And those stories sort of coalesce into to this book, although there's a much larger mission um, that he, he undertakes. And it's a lot of what we talk about during the show. Uh, Cliff's established himself as an authority on this, what really is a critical piece of American culture. Um, what makes it even more interesting is that he's from a rural area in Western Canada. And we get into that, too. Um, I can't recommend The Comedians highly enough. Really fantastic book. It's illuminating both in terms of the personal stories that it, it shows as well as the, the greater story of comedy and, and what it means in America and how it's evolved over a 100 years. But before we get to the conversation with Cliff, past podcast Liz Hand uh, is going to rejoin the show right now to talk about the release of her new novel, Hard Light. This is the third novel in her Cass Neary series about a nihilistic, burned out, drug addicted, post punk scene photographer who gets enmeshed in some pretty hardcore murder mysteries. Uh, I loved the first two of the Casaneri books, uh, Generation Loss and Available Dark. So with a new one coming out this week, I call Liz and Maine to uh, catch up and find out about the book. And here's that conversation. Tell me about Hard Light. Well, um, thank you. I'm glad that you enjoyed them. Uh, it takes up exactly where Available Dark left off. The books are written to, that you don't have to read them in order, um, but uh, if you do read them in order, they follow sort of a, um, uh, sort of a strange chronology. And so anyway, she basically gets off the plane from Reykjavik and she's in London where she's, um, going to rendezvous with her ex-con uh contract killer boyfriend Quinn and he doesn't show up and so she's kind of marooned in London she's there on a stolen passport she's got money but she doesn't know anybody and um almost immediately she hooks up with kind of a uh Amy Winehouse type um young woman who's a, a singer uh who's also kind of trouble and kind of gets pulled into an orbit that includes some uh, gangsters, sort of, you know, Cray Brother type unsavory sorts in North London, and a kind of rough flaneur um, named Adrian, and people who are connected in one way or another with this experimental, highly controversial film that was made in the 1970s and immediately pulled upon its release. 
a movie called Thanatrope, which has kind of a very sinister history that lingers all these years later on uh, it kind of casts a, a, a pall, a shadow over anybody who was connected with it then and any of their, you know, survivors or, or ancestors now, um, both cultural and artistic and, you know, actual children. So um, so that's the basic setup. So this is one place... where she, she settles down and, and discovers the virtues of child rearing and, and marriage. And no, stuff. Okay. no, oh <laughs> Not my God. Cats. I think I think that'd be like a really bad idea. I think that you know having having you know cast to your kinder care. I don't know. I, I, I see I see losses. I see like tabloid news. I, I see like bad things happening with that. So no, there's just kind of more um, more trouble. Although some you know that. Uh, her character does some. I think she, you know, she's developing in an interesting way as a character. Um, what have you learned about Cass, who you you described when we talked uh, last summer as you, if your brake lines have been cut when you were about twenty years old and and never been able to come back? Over the course of three novels, what have you learned about the the character? Well, she, um, for me, not to lose interest in her as a character, she has to to change. But she, you know, I don't want her to change, and I don't think that she would realistically change, uh, in in the sense of you know going into rehab and and you know undergoing some sort of real quote unquote redemption, the kind of you know somewhat typical character arc that that a lot of people and you know fictional people in books undergo. Mm-hmm. Um, but she has kind of a uh I, I don't know if I would go so in so so far as to say a soft spot, but she has kind of a, a twisted compassion for young people that she meets or sees who are in, in trouble. And, you know, in London there's a lot of them. Mm-hmm. There's a lot of homeless kids, a lot of homeless young people, a lot of kids with issues with drugs and alcohol, uh, a lot of kids with gender identity issues who have been cast down onto the streets or find themselves there, a lot of a lot of young people with mental illness. And I think she kind of looks at these people and recognizes herself there, um, both as a younger person and as she is now, you know, issues with addiction and um, identity. And so in that sense, I think she um, is sort of deepening, even if, if her relationships tend with people tend to be fleeting, I think you see you know, I think readers see a, a, a bit of a different side of her than has really been too apparent when she's, you know, I don't know, watching people getting garroted in um, the Icelandic wilderness, <laughs> situations like that. <laughs> but we've still got plenty of horrific scenes in, in this oh, new yeah. one, Oh, right? yeah. Yes, yeah, that Maureen Cargan um, just gave it a w- really great, you know, to die for rave review in the Washington Post, and she started it by saying something like Elizabeth Hand writes, you know, stories and scenes that are so disturbing that they can be, you know, almost hard to, you know, uh, to read or impossible yeah. to read, something like that. So it's still definitely got that darkness. Um, but, you know, I think you need to have that contrasted a bit with something else, just like in photography. You know, you need a contrast for things to really show up uh, in a powerful way. So I try to balance, you know, the dark stuff with a few little flickers of, um, of something perhaps a little um, more bright. And in keeping with the the first two books, in addition to photography and murder, is there a, a connection to a music scene in London? Yes. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Well, there's the, the young woman, Krishna, who is sort of a... Um, oh, the, the Winehouse-esque... Yeah. Yeah. The, you know, right. A kind of an up and coming singer and a sort of wine, Winehouse name. You know, not she's not really uh, her voice. You know, she has a voice like Amy Winehouse. I would say that's about it. But but she's from North London, which is an area I know well, which is also where where Amy Winehouse came from, uh, or where she you know was hanging out when she was certainly when she was singing and making her mark. But um, but then there it's also um, kind of a backstory of. Um, a group of uh, groupies, young women who are groupies in the 1970s who are now, you know, adults, uh, women who are not based on somebody like the GTOs or the plaster casters, but, but from kind of towards the end of that generation of young women. 
and they were involved with various musicians who were also kind of peripherally connected with um, this controversial filmmaker who made the movie Sonotrope, which is, you know, exerted this this dark um, pull, this kind of dark undertow all these years later. So there is that sort of uh, backgrounding in that music scene and, and, you know, there's a scene at a rave. Um, Adrian, who's the sort of um, very decadent man about town, who lives in a squat in in North London, and he arranges raves and um, empty buildings in, throughout the city. So, yeah, I think I would be. I think you'd be hard pressed to, to find anything of mine that doesn't have some kind of a soundtrack in it. Nice. <laughs> It's good, it's good that you have, you know, a couple of threads that make it distinctly you. That's that's great. Um, now, speaking of the insanely interesting movie within the, the book, are you hearing movie interest at all about Cass? Not that this is any sort of, you know, geek movie yeah, podcast no. or anything, but it does seem like your stories almost seem prime for, for some sort of adaptation. Yeah, there's definitely been interest. It, it, the generation loss is under option, um, and there's a... Um, you know, a pilot or a script screenplay for the pilot that's even as we speak is making the rounds in Hollywood. Uh, and I can't say who's looking at it, but some really interesting people, like really great people are looking at it. So, uh, you know, it's always a crapshoot with things like that. We'll just, we'll see what happens. But there's also been interest, um, several, uh, Scandinavian, um, producers have shown interest in the series. And so, um, well, I, I love uh, Nordic Noir, and, and these books do really well in Scandinavia. And they, they, they've done really well um, in Swedish, in the English language version, and they've just been translated and published in Swedish there. Uh, Generation Lost just came out last month, and I've been really kind of bowled over by the fanfare that it's gotten. I mean, it, it's had huge coverage. It was on the the front page of the equivalent of the New York Times uh, Sunday Magazine um, was a was a feature on me and, and on the book. So it was really they've got a big following there, and it's kind of weird, <laughs> but it's great. It's wonderful. It's like the reverse, you know, Stig Larsson in reverse. <laughs> yeah, sure. um, a, yeah. So anyway, so there has been interest, and it's just like I said, it's a crapshoot. You can't, you know, you you. Uh, can't get your hopes up, you know, hope for the best, expect the worst, and, and maybe something good will happen. Which sounds sort of like a motto for Cass, too. Yeah, well, I was, gonna, I was just <laughs> going to say, I said, actually, that's probably exactly how Cass would look at it, and that's kind of that's kind of the way I look at it. Fantastic. I'm looking forward to Hard Light. I've got it pre-ordered on Amazon, so I'm hoping to, to start it on Tuesday when it shows up. Great. Well, thanks so much, Gil. I hope you enjoy it. Thanks a lot, Liz. And that was Liz Hand. Uh, go check out Liz's previous Cass Neary novels, Generation Loss and Available Dark, and pick up Hard Light, available this week from Minotaur Press. And visit elizabethhand.com for more about Liz's work. And now we get the main conversation with Cliff Nesteroff. Uh, there is one weird meta caveat that I want to make about this whole conversation. It doesn't relate to the audio or the processing or anything else. Um... My caveat is that Cliff is a very, very funny man, and he's got a lot of great stories about old comedians. And the thing is, when I was researching to do this show, I heard a bunch of those stories from other podcasts that he had done. And I kind of gave myself the goal of not asking questions that would lead into those anecdotes, because I figure you could find those elsewhere. And if you're a fan of Cliff's work, I should be able to give you some new material. You know, and the flip side of that is if you're just a regular listener of this show and you don't know Cliff, in which case you really, really need to go find the podcasts that he did with Gilbert Gottfried, Mark Marin, and Longform. Uh, those are great conversations and a ton of hysterical stories. And Cliff does some really, really great impressions. Or maybe it's just one standard old Jewish comedian impression. I don't know. Um, but really, in particular, the episode of Gilbert Gottfried's amazing, colossal podcast that he does is going to leave you in stitches. Um, actually, our pal Drew Friedman sat in on that session. So it's Gilbert, Drew, Cliff, and Gilbert's partner, Frank Santapadre. Um, the laughs are pretty much nonstop. 
you really, like I said, go look up Cliff Nesteroff, which is spelled K-L-I-P-H, uh, as opposed to C-L-I-F-F. I didn't ask him what's up with that. Um, but look up Cliff, uh, find other podcasts that he's done. Like I said, Gilbert, Mark Marin, and Longform, and you're going to hear some great stuff. Now, one of the, the interesting things about the Gilbert one in particular is how all of the participants, all four of them, are like encyclopedias of comedy and show business. It it just totally informs who they are without it being an overbearing, you know, one-upmanship sort of thing. It just forms the background of all of their conversations. And I really treasure that that sense of shared history that these guys have with a culture that takes some work to get to know. And they've all put in the hours. They've all, you know, immersed themselves in this culture and, and it informs all of their work and the way they interact with each other and the way they make us laugh. So it's fantastic that Cliff's also managed to bring all of that into his first book, The Comedians, which, again, you should go buy. Anyway, the, back to the meta caveat. What I'm saying is, essentially, this conversation is sort of a conversational chess match, except the other person doesn't know he's playing a match with me, which is really, really the wrong way to go about this sort of thing. I probably should have mentioned to him at the beginning, but didn't want to make him self-conscious about avoiding telling a story. Um, and as it is, there are some pretty funny segments here, but you'll have to listen to some of the other podcasts Cliff has done to get an idea of how incredibly funny this man is. Um, here's Cliff's bio. Let's get on with the show. Cliff Nesteroff is a former stand-up comic turned writer, a longtime contributor to WFMU, writing about the history of comedy, Nesteroff's latest project is hosting the classic Showbiz Talk Show, a live series in Los Angeles that has welcomed comedy luminaries like Mel Brooks, Fred Willard, and Laugh-In creator George Slaughter. And Cliff's new book is The Comedians, Drunks, Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy. And now, the Virtual Memories Conversation with Cliff Nesteroff. Already in progress with a bit about Bruce J. Friedman. Yeah, I, and that was my, the funny thing was I'd only read a little of Bruce early and then sat down and read like the entire co collected short fiction before we got together and right. realized, oh, all those years that I was failing as a fiction writer because I thought I was supposed to be Philip Roth or Thomas Pynchon. It was actually him I was supposed to be a 10th generation knockoff of. Now I, I realize 20 years of my life I could have gotten back. By well, just, he and you know. Philip Roth were contemporaries and Joseph Heller. They were yeah, all part but, of a similar movement in a way. I mean, not, they're not the same. Uh, none of them are the same style, but they're all part of the same movement in the sense of this sort of new, wry, Jewish, right. humorist, okay. yet serious. You know, it was... It, even Jules Pfeiffer, as a, a an illustrator, kind of falls yeah. into their pattern. Oh, certainly, you know, they're Stern, all the same generation, you know, and they kind of brought a new yeah. uh, a feel. Sort of like the comedians of the '50s, the Nichols and Mays, the Mort Sauls, the Lenny Bruces, yeah. kind of spearheaded a new genre of yeah. stand-up in the '50s. These guys, same thing, literature, late '50s, early '60s. Jules Pfeiffer's cartoons. It was is very much that Woody Allen mystique of the neuroses yeah. and talking openly about sex and psychiatry and all of that. So, but And I think with Pfeiffer, and we've already started because clearly this has got to be part of the conversation. Sure, sure. Um, and I think with Pfeiffer, you see very much with the intersection with theater that he did repeatedly. And Bruce also went into theater. And, and Absolutely. You see much he wrote a lot of plays, yeah. Roth, on the other hand, stays mm -hmm. you know, within the more literary uh, areas, which leads me to my opening question, even though we've already started. Being a Gentile, how easy was it for you to, to you know, study comedy and the whole Borst Belt world and, and you know, given well, all the Jews that we have? Well, you're opening side. a whole can of worms here because <laughs> everybody thinks I'm Jewish. And, and that was my big surprise when I was researching it to find out that you're Well, Gentile. where did you find out this scandalous information? Oh, it must have been, was it Gilbert or was it Marin's, your first Marin appearance? Somewhere you mentioned not being Jewish and I was just stunned and thought, you know, <laughs> between the name and the fixation on the well, history of comedy. Yeah. I was maybe floored. I am Jewish though. Maybe I am. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I'm playing... Uh, a character, a Gentile with character. With the reddish beard, you could fit in with the reddish the beard. I have the... no Scottish background. I have no Irish background. So you, I think you're my last part... name's Nesterov. My family's from Russia. I'm so just I'm saying, probably it. Jewish, right? Yeah, I was assuming. <clears throat> when I met Carl Reiner, George Shapiro, who managed Andy Kaufman and Jerry Seinfeld, and now is like a thousand years old, and you see Howard West, George Shapiro, their producing partners, their names on uh, the end credits of every episode of Seinfeld. George Shapiro introduced me to Carl Reiner when I was starting out in stand-up when I was 19. 
And uh, Carl Reiner said, uh, what's your name? And I said, uh, Cliff. He said, Cliff, Cliff, what? I said, Nesterov. He goes, Nesterov, like Nemerov. Are you Jewish? Of course you're Jewish. All right, Cliff, Nesterov, never change your name. And I never forgot that. And funny thing is, I had already changed my name to KLIPH. But Carl Reiner assumed that I was uh, Jewish. And that's Carl Reiner. He's the straight man for the 2,000-year-old man, one of the most uh, Jewish uh, comedy routines of all time. So if, according to him, I'm Jewish, I guess I am Jewish. And furthermore, if Sammy Davis Jr. can be Jewish, then come on, at least I can be Jewish. He so be honorary. The thing is, this book came out. I get booked at a lot of Jewish uh, cultural events to talk about Jewish comedians, to talk about comedy, to talk about whatever. And... Uh, occasionally they will ask as they're booking me at the end of the thing they're like and you're jewish right and i and i don't really know what to say if i was at a trump rally and somebody said are you jewish you know you'd get very defensive right. like, what <laughs> kind of a question is that it's, no then it's usually are you a jew yeah that, that's yeah. a little different than being yeah. jewish well yeah. it even happened to me last week at the los angeles times festival of books a woman came up to me and said are you jewish and I was like, who's asking? <laughs> business of it is yours. And she said, well, I booked this thing in San Diego. And I said, well, As a I, matter do, of fact. I do. Well, no, I said, well, I do a lot of Jewish cultural events. She goes, oh, OK. I said, my last name is Nesterov. She said, I know, I know. I just I just I want to check. ask. Yeah. So I never said yes or no. I just said, my last name is Nesterov. I'm well, writing about comedians. I have red hair and I'm not Irish or Scottish. So. You come to your own conclusions. Well, my, my, my wife got booked for a freelance photo gig for a Mishpucha magazine, uh, I think because of being Amy Roth, when uh -huh. they didn't realize that she's a Cajun Mennonite who, you know, married in. But, right, you know, right. they, I think she showed up with, you know. The anyway. weird thing is that when I do a Jewish cultural uh, speaking engagement, they're never asking me about my Jewish experience. I would have nothing to say. They're asking me about Mel Brooks. They're asking me about Woody yeah. Allen. And that's fine. I can uh, speak uh, at length about it. But... In terms of being a, 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 a Gentile, I don't identify as that either. So I don't really know uh, the answer to that. Okay. See, I think deep down, you, you must be carrying that Jewish comedic DNA. But that's, the, thing, the other thing is, I've written extensively about uh, comedians in Manhattan in the 50s. My book, I get into Lindy's and the stage delicatessen and the Carnegie delicatessen. And when I was on my book tour last November, uh, I was here in New York and somebody asked me, they're like, you used to live in New York? Are you from New York? I go, I, I've never been to New York. Yeah, I realized that when I told you where we were going to meet and I, you just, where is that? I'm not sure where we are. I'm like, oh, wait a second. This guy isn't actually, you know, well, born my, the my girlfriend either, so. had no idea where this place was either. Yeah, but. It's, it's a strange little street. But yeah, I was just glad, you know, it, again, it put me, it gave me the realization that you've developed this incredible base of knowledge without it being, you know, first hand. Yeah, yeah, without it being the background for your well, life. Well, not yeah. only that, people think I'm much older than I am, yeah. you know, and I'm, I'm. And that disappointed me immensely because I feel like an immense failure at, at this age. Well, that, you should. You, know. you should, Gil. <laughs> you should feel like an immense failure because you are an immense failure. Yeah. But I, uh, you know, I've known, I was like a, a Henry Morgan authority at the age of 24, mm -hmm. you know, and he's in my book. I'm now 36, so now it's starting to make a little bit more sense. But. I've been kind of like uh, an expert in the history of comedy for like 10 years now, if not a little bit more. Uh, so none of it makes sense. Age-wise, where I was raised, I'm not American and I'm not Jewish. So, uh, But I might be Jewish. Yeah. I might be Jewish. I'm just, for the sake of this Some podcast, of <laughs> just for the sake of this podcast, I'm playing a non-Jewish character if all those Jewish cultural organizations are listening. But, uh, but where'd the comedy start? Where did the both your affinity for comedy and then your affinity for the history of well, it? Well, there's a few different uh, trajectories at play. Like anybody who anybody who gets into comedy as a performer initially is a fan of comedy. Mm -hmm. So I watched movies. You know, I watched uh, all the the, the VHS uh, uh, that came out that had John Candy or Bill Murray or Chevy Chase. Any SCTV SNL alum, I would watch their movies. Although I had never seen SCTV or SNL. Uh, as a kid, I watched all of those movies, so I loved that. But when I was a teenager, I started collecting records. I became like a record collector. I was very into music, still am, soul music, garage rock, rhythm and blues. And with that came comedy records. I would go to thrift stores and I would find comedy records and they'd be 50 cents, so I'd buy them. And a lot of the time there were people you knew, like Bill Cosby or Jonathan Winters or uh, Woody Allen or Monty Python records. But at those same thrift stores, you'd find records by people you'd never heard of before, like Rusty Warren or Woody Woodbury uh, or Von Meter's First Family. And those records tended to be the most common comedy records. And I couldn't understand why, because clearly they were bestsellers. They were in every thrift store. 
clearly these people had been famous, but they were completely unknown to me. So that kind of piqued my curiosity. So it came out of collecting comedy records that I got into the history of comedy. Because a lot of these records, especially the Woody Woodbury ones, would say, uh, recorded live from the nightclub floor, Miami Beach, Florida, Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Hollywood, Florida. And I, I was like, well, what is it about Florida? Why are these all from Florida? These records I was buying in the mountains of British Columbia, you know, in Canada, it made no uh, uh, sense to me. But over the course of time, I discovered that Miami Beach used to be the epicenter of stand-up. Before Las Vegas existed, that's where everybody went for legal gambling and legal prostitution and show business. You know, mm -hmm. So it's where all the comedians, uh, both uh, A-level comedians and D-level comedians, would perform in the 1930s, 40s, 50s, and 60s. So through these records, I kind of learned that history and became fascinated by them. I had this record I bought in a thrift store called... Uh, uh, Bill Cardi blasts off and it was that style of 50s artwork where it's just a floating head mm -hmm. on the cover and in the background was a nightclub that was painted like it was a uh, uh, the moon or like Venus or some planet with craters on the wall <laughs> and like uh, uh, um, planets with circular rings around them and it said recorded live at the orbit room Fort Lauderdale, Florida, Bill Cardi blasts off. So I, I just found that intriguing and interesting, and it kind of uh, showed me this kind of lost era of show business because I was aware of comedy clubs in the 70s, but I wasn't aware of this culture, this supper club culture. So through records, I started to amass knowledge just accidentally, reading the liner notes, listening to the records. I had another one called um, Alan Gale... Uh, Alan Gale, live from the Celebrity Room. Or no, live from Jack Silverman's International Room, I think it was called. And the record on the, on the, on the cover, it's a photo of a guy in like a straw hat with a cane in a suit. And you put this record on, it's a comedy record, but it starts off with this announcer going, Ladies and gentlemen, Jack Silverman's International is proud to present your entertainer, Alan Gale! And then this orchestra strikes up. Bop, bop, bada, bop, 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 bop. And the guy comes out, he doesn't start with a joke. He goes, where's the bachelor party? Where's the bachelor party? Bottle of champagne. Bottle of champagne for this table here. <laughs> oh, there's another one over here. Bottle of champagne. Bottle of champagne. It was the most show busy thing ever. And yet this guy was a comedian, you know. And then the jokes he told were all kind of street jokes. They were not, there was nothing about him. You didn't learn anything about Alan Gale through his entire act. It was all about, uh, uh, did you hear the one about the guy who was walking down the street, sees a lady, says, hey, miss, your pants are coming down. She says, no, they're not. I say, sorry, I made up my mind. You know, something like that. <laughs> yeah. So that was like an eye opener. I was like, this is just weird. It's not funny. It's not good. But it's a universe that apparently was common at one point. So that was kind of where my interest came. I just became curious through these comedy records, who these people were, why they were. And the fact that it seemed to be a very dense and immense culture that I wasn't aware of. And I don't think a lot of people were aware of or of a certain age, at least, uh, not aware of. After Lenny Bruce, Mort Saul, Jonathan Winters came along in the 50s, that style of comedy of the tuxedo, the cane, the straw hat, the, the being introduced with a song, the fanfare, a bottle of champagne, all of that kind of was forgotten about or it went out of fashion. And so I found that kind of interesting. And within the book, you also frame that as a transition from third person to first person humor. Right, that style of joke. And I botched yeah. it as I was telling it to you. Uh, where it became about Alan Yeah, Gale. sure, but, you know. But, yeah, it's supposed to be the, the, the element of joke-telling in which, did you hear the one about the doctor and the drunk? And then they tell you a, a joke about the doctor and the drunk. Um, but in the 50s, Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce, and Jonathan Winters kind of changed that. And, you know, I, I talk about it in the book where it used to be, did you hear the one about the doctor and the drunk? Suddenly it became, you know, man, I went to the doctor's office and there was this drunk there. Suddenly it became about your experience. Lenny Bruce talked about... What happened to him? Mort Saul talked about his political point of view, which up to that point had been taboo. You never talk politics on stage because you would alienate 50% of your audience. That was kind of uh, uh, the uh, the thought anyways. That was the, the, and then we learned confirmation bias and cocooning and, and found to go to just the right clubs. Right? That's right. That's yeah. right. You, you appeal to, you speak to uh, the converted, but you can make a great living speaking to the converted, you know? Um, even if you're not funny, you know, I mean, America has a whole culture of right wing radio shows. Most of the audience are people that agree with those views. And then the other uh, half of the audience are people that disagree, but they're just kind of 
want to be angry. So yeah, they'll turn into Rush him. Limbaugh, even yeah. though they despise him. And, <laughs> and uh, it's an interesting thing, yeah. Now, the book develops from a lot of the articles that you'd written over the years about well, the history of both the history of comedy and the history of particular comedians. Yeah. But in the process, you, you, you build a narrative to encompass the entire shebang. Can you sort of speak to what that process was like for you, or how, how you found the, the commonalities and the themes or the structure that you would you know, kind of embed these things well, in? Well, it would always drive me crazy when I would see... Uh, for instance, when the comedy store, the comedy club in Los Angeles, when it opened, it was decorated with murals on the wall of Eddie Cantor, Charlie Cha Chaplin, and the Marx Brothers. But the people that were on stage were like Jay Leno and Gallagher. And to me, it seems like there's no relation between those. And I think for almost everybody, there's no relation between yeah, those. Yeah, those are just classic comedy yeah, yeah, images, but yeah. not comedians. It has yeah, nothing yeah. to do with yeah. each other. There's no relation between Jay Leno and and Eddie Cantor. And yet people figure, well, comedy is comedy, so they lump them all together. I went and saw a low-budget documentary a few years ago about the Catskills, and it was the same thing. It showed footage of some comedian in the 30s, and they said, the Catskills gave birth to modern comedy. And then they cut to a clip from Seinfeld, like the sitcom. <laughs> and I was like, that leap of logic does not make any sense to me. Mm -hmm. I understand what they're getting at, but it just, no, there's no relation there. So when I was charting... Uh, the story of my book, which is a hundred years of uh, a comedy and the history of stand-up in particular in America, it was very important for me to connect the dots in between those two. Because Eddie Cantor is related to Jay Leno in the 70s, but only if you connect them with what happened in between them. Because one thing does lead to another in arts and the show business, but they don't leap over the course of decades and relate. So uh, for me... The themes of my book are struggle and influence. And the story of influence is really how you tell the story effectively. Well, so, I was going to say theft instead of influence, but, you know, that that's... Well, no, <laughs> Only in some of the cases. Not, not, not so much, because uh, influence, influence really creates the next genre of art, if that makes any sense whatsoever. So Mort Saul, Lenny Bruce... Jonathan Winters in the 1950s were revolutionary in stand-up, but they were all influenced by what came right before in the preceding generation. Uh, believe it or not, Lenny Bruce, uh, his mother, always said that one of his biggest influences was Jerry Lewis. Mort Saul was influenced by Henry Morgan, who was a radio satirist. And Mort Saul took it a little bit further to just be a little bit more contemporary, a little bit more political. But it was same same kind of acerbic cynicism mm -hmm. um some people would pro probably have uh, compared mort Saul to will rogers but mort Saul is very unlike will rogers but henry morgan occurred in between in the 40s and mort Saul is much more connected to will rogers and henry morgan is much more uh sorry mort Saul is much more connected to henry morgan and henry morgan is much more connected to will rogers mm -hmm. um so by charting all the dots instead of skipping dots, which is what most people have done when they're talking about the history of comedy, they skip the dots completely. And it just doesn't seem to make sense to anybody. You don't see the relation. But if you're more meticulous about the influences step by step, then it starts to make more sense. So for instance, there are Louis C.K. fans out there that love Louis C.K. who would not laugh once listening or watching Lenny Bruce. But if you explain that Louis C.K.'s hero is George Carlin and that George Carlin's hero is Lenny Bruce, then it makes sense all of a sudden. Yeah. Then you can see it. Then you, then you can go, oh, A leads to B leads to C. But traditionally, uh, people that have written about the history of comedy, they say A leads to C. And that doesn't make sense to me. So I was very meticulous about that. So when I was researching over the years, I always found it interesting to learn who influenced who and took note of that. And as I was researching that book, if I learned that Sid Caesar was a huge Henry Morgan fan, I paid attention to that. And if I learned that Conan O'Brien was a huge Sid Caesar fan, I paid attention to that. And by charting those influences, it makes a lot of sense. So if you go through the book and... and and uh, pay attention to that. You'll see it happening all the time. You know? yeah, do you see a particular node? Was there one person that you see more spokes coming out of than, than anyone else? Uh, yes and no. Yes and no. One of the guys, actually, I got it's cut right out of the book. He didn't make the cut. That's one of my next questions. <laughs> what didn't oh, yeah. make it in? But, well, yeah. there was a fellow <laughs> named Harry Ritz of the Ritz Brothers. Mm -hmm. And I don't see 
what the big deal was about him. If I all the existing footage of Harry Ritz is highly unlikely to make anybody laugh today. He was very shticky. He crossed his eyes. He did funny walks. But all the old timers say he was revolutionary. Uh, apparently, uh, Jerry Lewis stole much from Harry Ritz. Um, but uh, Alan King said Harry, Li- Harry Ritz was the funniest man who ever lived. Jack Carter said Harry Ritz was the funniest man who ever lived. Jerry Lewis said Harry Ritz was the funniest man who ever lived. And Mel Brooks said Harry Ritz was the funniest man who ever lived. I mean, that's a pretty uh, impressive resume and, and uh, a variation of comedians. Yeah, who, again, it's who, not one genre that's saying... Yeah, mm-hmm, yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, but I don't see it. When I go back and watch Harry Ritz footage, it seems horrible. I, I can definitely see the Jerry Lewis influence. It definitely has a lot of that mm-hmm. uh, stickiness. The, 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 hey, then that. There's a lot of that in there. Um, but So he stuck out a little bit more than others as an influence, Harry Ritz, although that was not derived from my research or, or an example that I could cite so much as the specific quote from these guys saying yeah. that, you know. Just a common... Yeah, yeah, they said, we all stole from Harry Ritz. If it weren't for Harry Ritz, there would be... This whole generation of us wouldn't exist. Um, later, certainly Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul were extremely influent, influential. Certainly, George Carlin always said that Lenny Bruce was like his apex, his hero, his shining beacon. Richard Pryor also said that about Lenny Bruce. Woody Allen said that about Mort Saul, that he uh, taught him the direction he'd like to go in, you know, a new genre of stand-up. Woody Allen couldn't really relate to that 1940s tuxedo style of comedy, but he felt like he could very much relate uh, to Mort Saul. Like that scene in Annie Hall where he's supposed to be writing, where the guy is pitching him on on writing jokes for him, and he's just got the smile plastered on his face, and the monologue is just, I can't do this. This isn't what I do. Yeah, Yeah. right, exactly, exactly. And Jonathan Winters begat, uh, Robin Williams and Robin always said that as well that that was his hero and he tried to emulate him this fast improvisatory style that uh, Jonathan Winters really uh, helped invent he was one of the first of the improv stand-up comics and now that's very common for guys to go up and wing it uh, but back in the 50s that was also a no-no you had to have basically scripted note for note uh, type of act a lot of that was because of Las Vegas where you had to be off the stage at a specific minute you know you couldn't go over 45 minutes they wouldn't pay you uh if you did and that was because they didn't like people being kept away from the gambling tables for too long you know so uh i i don't know that there was one person that was way more influential than the others but certainly lenny bruce mort Saul, and jonathan winters changed the game of stand-up in the 50s and influenced a generation of new comedians that followed in their wake from woody allen to dick gregory mike nichols and elaine may uh, Bob Newhart, Shelley Berman, all of these coffee house comedians who were sharing the bill with jazz musicians and folk musicians all throughout the 50s and 60s. Uh, and they would say, say as much, owed a great uh, debt of gratitude to, uh, to Lenny Bruce and Mort Saul and Jonathan Winters. Now, when the book came out, which comedians were most pissed off when they went into the index? And saw that either they had like a one-liner or they weren't mentioned in the book. Have you, oh, who have you heard from that was? Well, I don't want to. I don't want to tell <laughs> stories out of out of school, but there is a number of people who felt slighted, but they outsource the indexing to like a, a writing student. So there's actually some stuff that's missing from the index that there's people that are. Were you able to direct you know a certain pissed off comedian? No, don't worry. You're on you're on page two twenty five. I the... I did say that. Yeah, I don't really want to say. <laughs> no, that's who, okay. But a couple of people were upset, and a couple of people were upset they're not on the cover. It's a Sergeant Pepper uh, parody, so mm-hmm. it's got lots of comedians on it, but it's also got lots that aren't on it. But again, I didn't design the cover, so. Yeah. I had nothing to do really with uh, with those judgment calls, and that's what I have to tell comedians who are upset uh, that they're not on the cover. Although Ellen DeGeneres is on the cover, and she's not in the book, so it's a strange thing. But I had nothing to do with the index or the cover. Although I will say this, uh, when I first got my copy of the book, and I was reading through the index, I found the index very... Uh, uh, funny, and I, I think if some people were still alive, they'd be a, a, offended because it would say it says things like uh, 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 "Dick Cavett bombing," "Dick Cavett not considered funny by Dick Cavett." You know, it was like we should point out Dick Cavett's still alive, by the way. I love Dick Cavett. I was trying to think of some of the other people. Well, I had said like dr- uh, Buddy Hackett, drug addiction. I'm like, geez, this is uh, which was a great segment of the book. It, but, it, the, the index. You know, there, there could be a slander suit just over the index. 
<laughs> that's why you indemnify the publisher when when this stuff gets yeah. written. But uh, one of the well, again, the book is as we said, history of comedy. You, you talk about history of influence. It's also a history of media um, in very significant ways. As each medium develops, yeah. um, you, you start with vaudeville, radio, yes, movies, TV, yes, yes. internet. Those things all become comedy expands to fill those those media. At what point did that become uh, um, apparent to you, that that was sort of a, a theme for the entire shebang? Because that's the way, in a sense, that it's structured. I know it's chronological, but it also fits each of these these movements in each of these places yeah i i think it was uh i kind of saw it that way from the get-go mm -hmm. uh certainly something i learned i i learned the most about vaudeville in the process of, of research because vaudeville was not my expertise it was also not necessarily something i wanted to write about but the publisher asked me to so i did and I feared that I couldn't make it interesting. I was like, well, vaudeville seems intangible to our modern sensibility. How do you make it relatable? How do you make it interesting to people in the year 2016? And I kind of figured out a way by focusing on kind of the sex, drugs, and rock and roll aspect of being a touring uh, vaudevillian. But there wasn't much uh, media at the time other than uh, live stage or, or print, you know. Um, but if you go back and look through the history of film comedy, television comedy, radio comedy, nine out of ten performers in those mediums started on the live stage, either as stand-up comics or sketch performers. And so that made a lot of sense to me. And these guys sustained themselves as stand-up acts based on the level of exposure they would get in media. So, for instance, a guy like Louis Black is known as a stand-up comic. Hmm. But everybody uh, learned of Lewis Black because of Jon Stewart's The Daily Show and his frequent appearances on that program. So for that reason, uh, uh, these media uh, um, genres are as important as the live stage, and they kind of are responsible for people's careers. So in that regard, they're very, very important. We all know the Marx Brothers today from their movies, but the reason they got a film contract is because they were successful vaudevillians. Same with W.C. Field, same with uh, all these people. Fred Allen and Jack Benny were live performers, but they became wealthy men because of uh, a radio. Uh, you also cite Albert Brooks at one point who eschews live performance after you know it starts to... He was a, him, but, he was yeah. sort of an interesting case because he did television before he ever did stand up. Right. But he was kind of doing stand up on television. He was performing on some regional Los Angeles programs. He was on the Flip Wilson show. He was on the Dean Martin show. But he had never performed in a nightclub. And I believe it was Neil Diamond's manager saw Albert on one of those shows and hired him to be Neil Diamond's opening act. And Albert had never performed before a live audience before. He took the gig and he did well, but I don't think that was ever his ambition. Right. And he did not get nervous. He just did what he did on TV for a, a handful of years. But eventually he realized it wasn't for him and he got into short films and filmmaking. It's interesting how many guys stopped doing stand-up who were great at it. Mm -hmm. Woody Allen. Oh, that, that stand-up album. I, I, I had to play it for my wife recently. She'd never heard the, the Moose right, right. story. So yeah. that was, you know. Yeah, and Woody Allen was a great stand-up, but again, he was pressured into it. He didn't yeah. want to do it. He didn't have the ambition to do it, but his manager, Jack Rollins, said, if you want to make movies, we think it would be a good strategy mm -hmm. for you to ace stand-up first, and then we could market you better you know, and get you into film. So that's what he did. But I think about all the guys who were great stand-ups who quit in their prime. Albert Brooks, Woody Allen, Steve Martin, Eddie Murphy, Larry David quit stand-up. All of these. Yeah, Larry David would quit stand up a minute into a routine, though. That's you know, well, that's <laughs> true. That's true. It, with some of them, it seems that the success was the, the limiting step. Like with Eddie Murphy or Steve Martin, you're getting guys who are doing comedy in front of forty thousand people, and that's just you become too successful. There is yeah. such a thing as becoming too successful. Um, a lot of people get identified with a certain gimmick, and when that becomes super popular, that's a bit of a curse because it's maybe something the performer doesn't want to do anymore. But if they try and uh, retire it or change tracks that audience doesn't yeah. well, it's like a that's in every art field yeah it's like it. a famous band here's something from our new album and nobody wants to hear it they want to hear the greatest hits you know so that's true in comedy but it is interesting that a lot of guys who considered the most successful stand-ups of all time walk away 
uh, uh, early on or at their height or as soon as they have the opportunity to get into a, a different genre. Um, I don't think Roseanne does stand up anymore, to my knowledge. You know, um, there's a lot of uh, examples of that and instances of that. And a guy like Don Rickles and a guy like Bob Newhart, they still do stand up. Uh, theaters and casinos, but essentially they never switch up their act. They do the exact same thing. And I don't want to, I don't mean for it to sound mean to say that they're phoning it in, but it isn't really like a creative art form for them anymore. I think they still get something out of the uh, experience of hearing the live reaction from an audience and getting that adoration, you know, uh, but they, um, they don't actually uh, uh, create anymore. So I'm not, I'm not really sure what that, what all of that is about, but it is a young man's game in some respects. Not a young man. It, it's it's. Well, I don't know. I mean, Don Rickles and Bob Newhart, they still do about 100 dates a year, uh, which is quite but a I lot. Mean, I mean, creating, you know, coming up with new material. I mean, it's something that Chris Rock once brought up years ago, and it ties into the being successful problem. Um, and it's something that uh, I heard Jeff Ross once say about Springsteen also. We'll take the the Springsteen example. Uh, Bruce once wrote, used to write songs about people he knew. Now he writes songs about people he reads about. Right. And Chris Rocker was the same thing. He's like, I can't get the common guy's perspective. Right. They have right. to shut down a mall for me to go shopping. That's, right. That's, you know, becomes difficult. When, but that's only for stratospheric level talent. That's yeah. that's true. That's true. I saw Chris Rock perform at the Comedy Store the Friday before the Oscars. I went down there for that reason because I knew he'd be working out his monologue. And uh, I thought it was very good. It was also very interesting. This is sort of not speaking to your point. It's off topic, but... Oh, that's what I do. So. Uh, okay. <laughs> but he uh, he was working out his Oscar monologue, and it killed. And it, But it was interesting to see what he was trying to tighten up, what was getting a response, what wasn't. And then when I watched the Oscars that Sunday, again, it was interesting to see what he... What made it in. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But what I found interesting is that that Friday at the Comedy Store, he was testing out that monologue, and it was stand-up. He was doing stand-up. Then he does the Oscar monologue. Nobody refers to it as stand-up. Everybody just calls it the Oscar monologue. And I found that interesting because he was doing the exact same thing. And by the way, that material went over way better at the Comedy Store than at the Oscars, mostly because the audience is not as uptight. They're there to see stand-up. They're excited because it's Chris Rock. It was a surprise for them. Um, and he blew the roof off. He did great at the Oscars as well, but that's a tough room. There's a lot of pressure on you. Uh, half the audience is distracted because they're thinking about the fact they're nominated or whatever. Yeah. Um, but I just find it interesting that a lot of people do stand up in disguise. Like it's almost not referenced as stand up. Uh, Larry David hosted SNL uh, last fall. He did an opening monologue. He did material. And he'd actually worked out that material on stage at the Laugh Factory as a stand up uh, routine. Uh, in the two months leading up to it. And so anybody who went and saw him at the Laugh Factory, you know, was saying, oh, I went, Larry David did stand-up the other night. But then you'd watch him host uh, SNL and do that same material in the monologue, and nobody says, did you yeah. see Larry David do stand-up? So it's kind of interesting. That's Now, what did your stand-up experience teach you, one way or the other? It Comedy. taught me that uh, this, this podcast is not teaching anybody this, but it taught me that I'm funny. <laughs> and... That was very important. It gave me a great deal of confidence. Like from a personal standpoint, uh, I already knew I was funny, but that verified it. You know, that proved it. Uh, it proved that I can get up in front of an audience and make people laugh at will. And that was something that when I quit stand-up, nobody could ever take away. You know, you don't stop being funny. You either are or you aren't. Um, so it's like even that Funny Bones movie with Jerry Lewis, but I, I have not seen. You've it. never seen Funny Bones? Is it the one from like '84? Or no, 83? no, uh, '90s. Uh, oh, Al with Lee, Oliver Platt and Lee, Lee Evans. Lee Evans, Greatest, right? Uh, I do remember that. Yeah. I have seen yeah. it. I okay. have seen it. But, yeah. well, I saw it on VHS yeah, again because yeah. you were watching these movies. I took that one out of the Toronto Public Library, actually, as I recall. But I, I, I was a big Lee Evans fan at the time, and uh, that guy's career is completely. Uh, yeah, he just out. does like stage in the UK. Yeah, as near as I could tell, he was supposed to be the next big thing. He was really hot in the '90s, yeah. doing that physical shtick where he uh, inflated and deflated himself, and uh, it just never happened to the level it was supposed to. The story I heard was that Lee Evans bought into his own hype and became a bit insufferable and a bit arrogant because he was sure he was going to be the yeah. next Eddie Murphy or whatever. And that never quite happened, but, uh, but anyways, uh, standup taught me that I was funny so that when I quit standup, if there was anybody I met who didn't think uh, I, I was funny or were to insult me and say, you're not funny. It was not something that would ever phase me. 
because it was the one superpower I knew I had that could not be taken away. Somebody could say I'm a bad writer, and I'd be more likely to believe that than uh, uh, to say I wasn't funny because I could do stand up, you know, and I could succeed at stand up. So I did that for I did stand up for eight years, which is not a long time in stand up uh, uh, numbers. Mm-hmm. But uh, did it give you any sort of credibility or any sort of card you could play with some of the the comedians you were interviewing and no i never brought it up i never brought up my stand-up career when i interviewed anybody for this book uh tom drees and i interviewed uh for this book and i found him very offensive uh, to me because he kept uh saying well what you don't understand cliff because you're not a comic but we comics (laughs) and i was just like shut the fuck up that's what i'm wondering is is there a point at which you had to break out the you know yeah I've done no, this too. No, so, I just okay. let him talk okay. and be an asshole. Mm-hmm. Uh, I, he made for some great material in the book. so you know. He's quoted in the book. He's a strange, strange guy. He's sort of like a modern-day Joey Bishop. And by that, I mean he's a guy who has succeeded to an extent, but only so far to an extent because he's a great showbiz politician. He knows who to know. He's a nice guy. I kind of think he's a phony uh, but he's not truly a funny person. He's he's a guy who knows how to perform because of years of experience. But you're not going to meet one person in the history of show business who says, you know who my favorite is? Yeah. Tom Driesen. That sentence has <laughs> never been said ever. But he's kind of a nice guy. But he's more of a businessman hmm. pretending to be a comedian. He's very good at the mechanics of it. And he's done very well investing his money in business ventures. But his, his, his stand-up could not be more bland and generic. But anyways, he was very dismissive of some of the things I was saying to him, which I've never had that experience before. Usually it's the opposite because I have a le- level of understanding from doing stand-up that I don't talk about. But it's, it's there. Yeah. You know, I'm not asking the bullshit that a lot of other people uh, when they interview comedians do, because they do get asked the same questions all the time. Where do you come up with material? Where do you get your ideas? You know, stuff like that. And uh, I'm not I'm not like that. I know what it's like to do stand-up, and I know what it's like to have a bonehead come up to you and say, hey, tell me a joke. You know, I know, I know what it's like. So this book, I think, resonates with comedians for that reason. It has that undercurrent of knowledge without even being explicit about it you, you know? don't cite material My, Never. You, you know you talk a little about some of the the shape of some of the acts but yeah you don't go explicitly into because explaining a joke or putting it in print well i mean these are jokes that yeah. are meant to be delivered within the context of an act in somebody's specific voice out loud on a stage if you transcribe it it loses a lot of the magic if not all of the magic there's a couple uh, uh, mentions of material in there. I, I quote one joke from Chris Rock's original act from like 1987, where I say he sounded like Henny Youngman. Chris Rock was doing this joke on stage. He said, uh, uh, "My father's the cheapest man on earth. He's so cheap that he unplugs the clocks when we go to bed." You know? <laughs> I did laugh at that. Yeah, one. yeah. <laughs> but like, I knew that that translated well to print. That's the only way yeah. I would include a joke like that. You know, it it just it worked in or out of context like that joke would work on a wall calendar you right. know what i mean uh so that's the only reason i, I bother to cite it but most material is in stand-up it's very delicate and only works within the context of what is said before it and after it you know regardless of, of set up punchline like it in stand-up usually you put your strongest material right at the start and your strongest material right at the end and you put all the bullshit in the middle and you can create the illusion of that bullshit in the middle being as strong as the rest of it because you've already made them laugh this hard at this mm-hmm. and you're going to bookend it with that. Um, but if you took the middle out of that context and just did that material <clears throat> that wasn't as strong and just presented it, it would not be as effective. So there's all these kind of – it's boring, but there's all these kinds of tricks to stand-up that stand-ups figure out and that they know. Um, you know, If you talk loud and fast – that's more effective most of the time. You can get big laughs by talking loud and fast. Energy has so much to do with stand-up. The consistency to your persona. There's certain jokes that work for Zach Galifianakis that he's doing in stand-up because it's a surreal type of joke yeah. telling. And that kind of material that Zach does would not work in, in the mouth of Lewis Black because Lewis Black is talking about the real world. And meanwhile, Zach Galifianakis is talking about putting an Altoid up his asshole. <laughs> Now, if Lewis Black said it, maybe it would be funny, but it would definitely seem out of character and out of context of the rest of uh, 
of what he's saying. So I, I actually sold Zach a joke for like two dollars because he thought it was, <laughs> he thought it was funny, but I, I I never got a laugh with it because it wasn't it didn't fit the context of my act, it, but it would fit the context of somebody like him. He did all these surreal non sequiturs, and I had this stupid line about how I'd accidentally locked Alicia Keys in my car. You know, it was just a play on words, <laughs> just a play on words. It never got a laugh, but I thought it was like, I don't know, I thought it was cute. And so I gave it to him for $2, and he used it in his act, and he got a huge laugh. I'm envisioning Stephen Wright with yeah, that, too. And yeah. that's, you know. Yeah, exactly, right. exactly. Well, Zach's style is very similar to, to that kind of non-sequitur, surreal. Uh, he Those types of acts, to the contrary of what I was saying, how... People put the strongest at the front and the strongest at the, at, the, at the end and the bullshit in the middle. People like Stephen Wright and Zach, their jokes do work out of context, but uh, that's very rare. Most comedians these days, anyways, they don't perform like joke jokes. Right. You know, it's just not the style anymore. Um, and it's funny, Henny Youngman gets maligned as being square or old fashioned, and people, if they quote, take my wife, please, it's like to indicate that this is not a good comedian. He's very, take yeah. my wife, please. Um, but that that style of comedy still exists, and it's done by guys that are considered hip. Zach Galifianakis, Dimitri Martin, Mitch Hedberg. They do jokey jokes that are surreal, and Henny Youngman's were like that too. Rodney Dangerfield in the 80s as well, his material was also sort of like that, short, jokey jokes. And Rodney in the 80s was embraced by the college-age crowd. He was considered very hip uh, for an old guy anyways. But his hero was Henny Youngman. And before he was famous, uh, Rodney Dangerfield used to go to the Paramount here in Manhattan and study Henny Youngman's act and, and try and figure out what he was doing. And so he very much was inspired by, influenced by uh, Henny Youngman. And it's kind of funny that Henny Youngman is dismissed and considered square and that Rodney was embraced in the 80s and considered hip by college students. You know, it's all about how you frame yourself, you know. And so much of it is luck. I mean, it's, it's, again, another common theme throughout the book is one guy, you know, has it 10 years later than another guy, and that's when it's the right time for this sort of humor, and this, this takes off. My question about Dangerfield, do you have any idea how he stayed out of prison? He uh, got indicted for um, the Tin Man scandal. Yes, yes. <clears throat> I don't know. I, it was some sort of deal. Robert Klein knows a little bit more about it than I, but well, all he knows is what Rodney told him because they were close friends. And he said they brokered some kind of plea deal okay. where he paid some kind of fine. But yeah, you're right. He did commit uh, fraud in the uh, Tin Man uh, type scams that were going on uh, in the 1950s, which Barry Levinson made a whole movie about, yeah. uh, which is a pretty good film if people want to know more about what the Tin Man uh, scandal uh, is or was. But basically he was frauding uh, uh, widows of soldiers and plying on their... Uh, um, tragic sort of not naivety but uh, but their grief and their yeah, their, yeah he was and he was exploiting them saying yeah. you know <clears throat> I served with your son in the war and thanks to the uh, United States uh, government I can get you discounts due to the GI Bill on any kind of home repair you might want and I see that your shutters here are a little bit frayed we can get you a great deal just sign right here and he would pressure these poor women into signing these skewed contracts where he did not get them a deal, but would charge them 10 times what some of this work was worth. Sometimes they would do the work. Sometimes they wouldn't do the work at all, but they would enrich themselves uh, through this scam. I mean, the FBI set up a sting operation over the course of a year. They monitored Rodney Dangerfield. This is before he was famous. He was uh, he had done stand-up, and then he quit stand-up and started this business uh, in, in the early 50s, it was called Pioneer Construction Co. And they were doing aluminum siding and painting and fixing things in Jersey and Long Island. Um, but uh, I don't know who tipped who off. It uh, He was not the only person at the time doing these kinds of scams. They were fairly common around here. Uh, but at 5 in the morning, they broke into Rodney Dangerfield's home and arrested him in his underwear. And uh, it, was, it was splashed all over the, the front page of the news in uh, Long Island. And... Uh, he did not go to go to prison, but he was found guilty of uh, of defrauding people. Yeah, that's what I'd wondered because the the chapter is in, in, or the section in the book is wonderful, and I remember reading it in your your original online version. All right, um, and there's just that that hole in terms of you know he gets indicted and everything goes wrong. Yeah, well, I was curious about that. Without... <laughs> I was curious about that too because yeah. there was no follow up in the news, and at yeah. the time, Rodney Dangerfield's name. 
was Jack Roy. His birth name was Jacob Cohen, and then he changed it to Jack Roy. And that's what his name was when he was busted yeah. uh, in, in this uh, in this scandal. Uh, but I, the only real follow-up I got about it was from Robert Klein. Uh, if you read Rodney Dangerfield's uh, autobiography, there's no mention of this bust whatsoever. He says that I was... Uh, doing construction i was uh, putting up aluminum siding i was making a good living but it wasn't living yeah so i had to get back <laughs> into show business and so that's a larger hole in his book than uh, than mine but well, that's, yeah. that's 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 pre-internet you know there's there's no fact checking uh, and in that era the same way we well would, would... even today i mean a lot of these guys who are celebrities that write memoirs it's uh, their word against their ghostwriter and the ghostwriter yeah. doesn't challenge them they just put down the words and publish mm -hmm. it as fact um, maybe they don't realize that their lies could be called upon, yeah. you know, but, you know. Now, what did you learn about storytelling in the process of building a book as opposed to the, and they were long form pieces you were doing previously, um, through FMU and, and your other writing, but how did a book differ in terms of, uh, well, it differs tremendously, but I mean, I had to rely heavily on my editor to guide me in a lot of ways, hmm. um, because I was used to the short form, but that's kind of how I constructed it initially and then able was to hang things on sort of these uh disparate elements yeah. so but it, they fit organically that's i don't want to give the impression that they're like well eventually it did pieces. but oh, when okay. i started my first draft it was as if i had a bunch of articles separately because that okay. made it easier to write sure. so i'd kind of tell the story individual stories first before figuring out the way to align the organic flow um, a lot of it, a lot of it had to do uh, the the chronology helps. It's a chronological book, and that made it a little bit easier. It's easy to tell the story of the '60s if it's coming out of the '50s. Again, mm -hmm. that whole thing about uh, connecting the dots of of, of of influence and continuity uh, made that a great deal easier. I mean, I have a file on my computer that's 900 pages long of stuff that's not in the book. Yeah. Some of it is written, some of it is half written, some are just random facts, but there was a lot of material there. Besides Harry Ritz, what do you wish you could have included? Well, I wish I could have included all of it, but it would have bored everybody to yeah. death if I included all of it. Red Skelton got cut out, Don Adams got cut out, Steve Allen, there was a big story that I had, which I did put online, but was originally for the book about how uh, he was having an affair with one of his girl singers on the Steve Allen show. This woman named Jenny Smith put out a number of records who actually looks exactly like Jane Meadows, his <laughs> wife. Um, but Jane Meadows got word of it and, uh, you know... Uh, didn't take it well? It didn't take it well. Steve mm -hmm. Allen had to break up with his mistress. And then this woman, Jenny Smith, uh, backstage at the Steve Allen show, uh, attacked Steve Allen with a pair of scissors and tried to stab him. And this was going to go to the news. The network was able to cover it up, but they had to uh, get Steve Allen to do them a favor. Steve Allen at the time was doing a segment, which Westinghouse, the company that uh, owned the show, despised. Later, Steve Allen turned it into a PBS show, but the segment was called Meeting of Minds. And the premise was, non-comedic in nature, he would get a bunch of actors to play famous philosophers. So you'd have Darwin... Uh, uh, debating uh, with Bertrand Russell, debating with uh, uh, whoever, you know, Aristotle, talking about law, talking about crime, talking about punishment. And a lot of the things that they were saying were kind of radical ideas for American television in the early 60s. Um, and it wasn't comedy. It was supposed to be serious. Steve Allen wanted to be erudite. You know, he wanted to be considered an intellectual. So he had written this recurring segment and Westinghouse hated it because he had these <laughs> one it was boring yeah. two it was a comedy show it wasn't funny and three they're saying kind of radical political yeah. concepts so they said you got to get rid of meeting of minds and Steve Allen said no then this scandal happened with Jenny Smith and the scissors and they said you got to get rid of meetings of minds or else we're going to invoke the morals clause and cancel the contract so they managed to get rid of meeting of meeting of minds that way but eventually Steve Allen said listen you know I, I'm gonna. I own the show. I'm gonna take it somewhere else, and he canceled it himself. Uh, that actually opened the door for a San Diego television personality to take over the time slot. His name was Regis Philbin, and they put in a show called That Regis Philbin Show, and started in 1964. And that was Regis's first break. Uh, all of that is not in the book. It got cut out, but, uh, but paperback. 
paperback edition. Who knows? I don't think I don't know. I <laughs> now don't that you're giving it all away, <laughs> I really don't know what we're going to add for the paperback or the uh, audio book, which comes out later in the year. But uh, but yeah, so that got cut out. Steve Allen, Don Adams, Red Skelton, uh, a lot of vaudeville stuff. I had some stuff in there about this guy, uh, Doc Rockwell. Doc Rockwell was a vaudeville comedian. His son and Doc Rockwell was quite successful in the 1920s. His son came to prominence in the early 60s. His name was Norman Lincoln Rockwell, the leader of the American Nazi Party. And his father was a vaudeville comedian, a very successful one in the 20s who had worked with Groucho Marx. And he was not an anti-Semitic man, but his son, of course, was a, was an American Nazi. Uh, that got cut out of the book. So I just had a lot of great stories, but you know, you only need so many great stories to tell a greater story, like an overall story. And so a lot of stuff got cut just for space or redundancies or... You know, a good story is a good story, but it may not fit the whole kind of oeuvre of the uh, uh, story I was trying to tell overall, you know. So lots and lots of stuff got cut out. Yeah, there was a, when I was going back and doing my research to, to you know, try to seem as though I know what I'm talking about with you, I was checking out your first Marin show, mm -hmm. uh, which I remember hearing about three or four years ago when you, you were on. Um, you mentioned at the time that you were avoiding race topics in the, the shorter pieces you were writing. Trust me, you, you said it. Um, and, and race actually does play a significant role in, yes, in the, the book. Do, do you remember getting over that idea of, well, well I'm not really the guy I, who I, should I, be discussing you know, well, black no, issues? I mean, or... I had already written uh, a couple articles regarding race. I think what I said more or less was that... You avoid racial topics was... was how well, you, no, you, it was yeah. that when I do write about race... <clears throat> It tends to be less entertaining for the reader because it's unavoidable uh, not to be a little bit didactic. Sure. You know, you're talking about very ser serious topics and it opens you to criticism. So even if you're informed, if somebody disagrees with you, they're going to attack you. And race in America is a can of worms that people love to attack you about. And if you're a white man defending uh black rights or talking about black history it opens you up to criticism from both sides you know from the side that you're sympathizing with they'll say you know why is a white guy talking about yeah, how this? dare you tell our story yeah. yeah and then of course you get the opposite you get the sort of fox news bill o'reilly thing who says well th this is you know not true they had it very good or whatever the kind yeah. of condescending thing is so uh for that reason i wouldn't write about race as often as I would want, because it just wasn't as entertaining, you know. So I had written an article about Moms Mabley uh, in 2007 or 8, it didn't, and it, you know, it did very well. And then I wrote another article, this is what I talked about on the Marin Show, about Pigmeat Markham. Mm -hmm. And I had never gotten so much blowback in uh, the comments as I had with that article, article about Pigmeat Markham. I talked about the history of blackface, I talked about uh the NAACP fighting against Pigmeat Markham's use of blackface he was an African American who put blackface on a lot of people don't realize that that was a thing uh people know about minstrel culture in the 1880s up through the 1920s and white performers wearing blackface but it was not really considered a a malignment of, against uh, uh black people if you put on blackface it was actually considered theater makeup stage makeup you'd put on blackface if you were an actor there were plays where people would put on blackface, never referenced the fact that they were supposedly uh, black characters, you know. And so uh, also there were a lot of black performers who blackened up and sort of exaggerated the mouth. And Burt Williams was the most famous example. Pygmy Markham, who was a comedian, also did that. So I wrote about that and I wrote about sort of the struggle that these older black performers had with the NAACP when they stepped in and said, you know, it's post-war, you know, times have changed. You don't have to do blackface anymore. And Pygmy Markham was very adamant. He goes, no, this is my tradition. This is tradition. I'll always blacken up. And the reality was he was just very insecure and couldn't, he had never performed without it. And he didn't want to change. He was scared. But so I wrote about that at length. But it also came across as maybe uh, overly scholarly. I was writing an online article on the yeah. website. So it wasn't as fun as talking about Steve Allen being stabbed with scissors. Right. You know what I mean? And I was kind of known for that kind of writing. So, but it was something near and dear to my heart. You know, I, I weaned on records and primarily on black music. So that culture spoke to me first and foremost. 
And also, I'm Canadian, and there is something about having a perspective about America and American culture when you're from outside of America. I literally have Canadian perspective, question mark, written down really? here. So good. Really? <laughs> you covered that one. But I mean, but even, yeah, even was living here now during a presidential election, like I feel like I have a different perspective. And it's yeah. not just a matter of Donald Trump being a lunatic, as the whole structure of it is, is crazy to anybody who is born... Certainly in a Western uh, uh, society outside of America, but probably all the world to look at this country and realize you can only choose between two political parties is insane. Yeah. Every other country in the world, you have multiple parties to choose from with all kinds of different perspectives as opposed to just two parties that are dominated by corporations. But that's strictly my Canadian perspective. You know, I'm like, how could people not realize just because you have a D in front of your name, it hardly means you're left wing at all. Yeah. But many people here, smart people, assume that it does mean that, that there's only two sides to every issue, right. the right wing side and the left wing side. And the right wing side is represented by Republicans and the left wing side is represented by Democrats. Where in reality, the overwhelming majority of Democrats who are in power in this country would be considered right wing in most other Western countries in the yeah. world. And most Americans or a lot of Americans don't realize that. So that's my Canadian perspective. So it was the same with like black history to look at black history and black culture and racism in America and how much more racist even uh, America remains today than maybe people realize. I think more and more they, people are realizing that there's a new level of activism that comes with YouTube videos showing horrendous incidences that people can witness, you know, that maybe they didn't believe occurred before, yeah. unless, of course, they were black and, and experienced it all the time. So I, I very much like writing about that kind of stuff. And since this history of comedy is also a history of America, you know, I talk about World War II, I talk about the late 60s uh, paradigm shift, I talk about uh, the drug culture, I talk about 9-11, I talk about the JFK assassination. There's all these sort of cultural harm, hallmarks that I use. And Nixon trying to go after Cavett. That's Richard Nixon, <laughs> yeah, absolutely. Watergate, all of it. All these kind of American historical cultural touchstones throughout the 20th century. I kind of tell all of those stories through the prism of these comedians. So when the JFK assassination happened, I talk about what it was like for these comedians who were booked the week before the JFK assassination, those that were booked the same night as the day that that happened and the the sort of temperature of the country and nightclubs where comedians were performing in the weeks after the assassination you know from their point of view which i find uh, uh interesting and that to answer one of your earlier questions that's kind of how i found a way to tell this larger story rather than just individual isolated articles which i had previously done by tying everything onto sort of the history of the 20th century period comedy or not I was able to tell a cohesive story of, uh, of, of comedy by, by using those as sort of the uh, hallmarks to hang things on. Yeah, it was, I was, one of the few moments of disappointment I had was the 9-11 segment where you didn't mention the Gilbert joke. I saw uh, a couple people mentioned that. Yeah, a couple people mentioned that. I, yeah, but I understood. You know, there's, well, there's... The, the main reason I didn't mention it is because I felt it had been talked about to death. Sure. And in fact, had a documentary spun out of it. So. Right, yeah. Um, so, I mean, that was, there's a few things that aren't in the book that might surprise people. Uh, when I do uh, interviews, in fact, when I did Leonard Lopate's show, we talked oh, about... brag, why don't you? <laughs> <laughs> we talked about Jack Benny's uh, program. And again, in the comments section, they put it online. In the comments section, people were saying, oh, he forgot to mention the most famous joke. He forgot to most mention uh, your money or your life. He didn't mention your money or your life. It's the famous Jack Benny uh, uh, incident. It's also not in the book. And the reason is not because I was ignorant of it. It's because it's mentioned in every book about comedy. So sure. the majority of the stories I tell in my book, hopefully, are stories that are new to 90% of the people that read this book. Mm -hmm. And I have heard from countless comedy nerds, lifelong comedy fans, and a lot of the reviews that say, uh, I thought I knew everything about comedy. I thought I'd heard every story. And literally on every page, I learned something new. And that was really my goal. I want this book to illuminate the things that are interesting that you did not know about. That's kind of what I've always felt was my knack, even online, to tell the stories that had not been told before. And I think you do a fantastic job of it. Oh, it's, thank it's, you. It, well, there's two questions uh, that have nothing to do with each other. First, 
Um, do you feel there's comedy nerd and then comedy scholar or comedy historian? Is is that where you are? Because it's not exactly nerddom. This right. this is this is a much more I don't want to say rigorous because it makes it sound boring, uh, but this is a much more uh, deeply right worked out book. Yeah, it's so. more a work of scholarship. Well, yeah. I don't know. I mean, I. I, both of those phrases are never phrases that I used. Yeah. You know, comedy nerd is a recent phrase of the last five to ten years, and uh, Mark Maron's blurb on the back of the book says that I'm a comedy nerd. But mm -hmm. I never thought of myself that way. It's just one of my many interests. But I use the phrase comedy historian now because nobody else is identified as a comedy historian. So what a great niche for me I'll to get say you a teaching I'm, job somewhere. Oh yeah, absolutely. And I mean. I'm just as deeply immersed in the history of film, the history of music, uh, uh, the history of popular culture, television, all of those things I have a pretty strong grasp on. But Leonard Moulton already exists. He's got right. it cornered. Uh, Jerry Beck is the world's foremost animation historian. He's got that market covered. There's a million guys who write about music. So I don't need to be another one of those guys. But there's no other comedy historians. There's people who are Bob Hope biographers, or there's people that have written books about Groucho Marx. But there's no sort of uh, far-reaching comedy historian. Uh, so I'm happy to pick up that mantle because I do then get you know all kinds of gigs out of it. You know, I'm the go-to guy all of a sudden. So that's a great delight and a great pleasure. And now I'm embracing it, though initially. I had a huge aversion to the phrase of historian because it just it's make people, it sound dry. People assume that you're going to be boring. Yeah. Yeah. You know, and that's the last thing I want is to be a, a dullard. So although low expectations, you can you can you know It does over help on the literary the circuit when I do shows because yeah. uh, people assume I'm going to be dull. And when I go on stage, I, it's, it's fairly well thought out. Even though I'm improvising it, I know where the laughs are. And more and more, as I do literary events, it's a throwback to when I did stand-up. Because you learn which anecdotes, which sure. voices, what gets the biggest response. And now, you know, I definitely go for laughs. Um, but also, if I don't get laughs, it's okay. Because there's not the pressure. They're not expecting a comedian. It's just a historian. Uh, so people are generally uh, pleasantly surprised. So well, I had a moment. I was I was an MC for uh, Tom Tomorrow, the the political sure. cartoonist. Um, we did a podcast last summer, and then we did this live event uh, to celebrate the Kickstarter he'd done. And I figured to make it easier, I was going to do the intro. He was going to do his slideshow, and then we do an interview. And um, I got a laugh from a line in the intro that I did not expect from the 150 right. people in the audience, and right. I thought. Okay, I'm going to slow this down now and, and let that next line really, right. you know, work. And, and it was just that moment of this is going to be an easy audience, not, you know, somebody who, you know, right. they're, they're all struggling. And did you do, uh, have you been on stage since that time? Have you ever seen anything? No, no. And this was I'd just, be curious, maybe you try that line again and see if it works. Oh, it was just related to how I introduced him in, in right. particular. But yeah, there's just that realization. Part of it comes from doing this. 200 times and, and part of my day job, getting up in front of, of government panels and, and talking. Right. Um, that you start to realize what works and what doesn't. But when people are actually paying for drinks and they expect laughs, I, I would feel a lot more. Well, the uh, pressure is much higher and yeah. people actually challenge comedians sort of subtly. I'm not going to laugh. And, yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's a make me laugh. Prove right. that you're funny. Yeah. Whereas if you do the same material at a uh, poetry open mic, they're assuming that it's going to be boring and drab. So if you are funny, you get laughs that are twice as hard. Um, and it's the same with the literary circuit. Everybody is uh, very unshowbiz, uh, which is both uh, um, good for me, but it's also a little bit frustrating because you'll get introduced by somebody who's reading a piece of paper going, ha, 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 ha. and then it's kind of up to you to warm up the audience. Mm -hmm. You know, In comedy, you have an MC, and their job is to warm up the audience, and they get paid to do that. And so by the time you go up there with your act, you're, you're good. Yeah. Um, but if you don't have that, you know, then it takes a while for things to get going. Um, and I do have that, uh, issue, uh, frequently when I do book festivals and stuff, but it's kind of funny that, uh, uh, because they're not expecting me to be funny. The first few minutes when I say a lot of things, often it, it makes people puzzled, puzzled. Yeah. Cause they, feel, they're not sure if they're supposed to be laughing. They don't necessarily <laughs> are comfortable because I can be yeah. very abrasive and foul mouth. So it, it's sometimes it's hard stunning. to believe, <laughs> <laughs> but when, but when people settle into the persona that I have, uh, then, you know, it's smooth sailing after a couple minutes, but yeah. Where did writing come from? Not, not human historically, but for you. Uh, I, I started writing as a teenager. I was a poet 
Uh, I was obsessed with the Beats, so anything that was published by City Lights, New Directions, or Grove Press, uh, I would read. No matter what, if I saw the spine in the library, Grove Press, their logo, the City Lights logo, it didn't matter what it was, I would read it. And I read all of them, the famous poets, the obscure poets, Kenneth Patchen on New Directions, one of my all-time favorites, uh, all of the Pocket Poets series that... Farrell and Getty published, uh, Gregory Corso, Malcolm Lorry, uh, even Picasso put out a, a book of poems on City Lights, uh, Denise Levertov, all these great beat writers were my, my, my absolute heroes and that culture as well. And uh, when I was 18, I hitchhiked across Canada from the Pacific Ocean to the Atlantic Ocean and back by myself with my notebook. You know, I was just so uh, intrigued by the whole beat generation uh, uh, thing. So I wrote poetry when I was 16, 17, 18. But I was also uh, funny. I already knew that I was funny. And again, that was like this incredible knack that other poets didn't have or other writers didn't have. So that's where it came from initially. And uh, then I, I learned that you could make money writing comedy. So I wanted to write television sitcoms, which is really the antithesis of a... Comedy. Of, of, Sorry, go of, of, yeah, yeah, of comedy. <laughs> or yeah. literature, in my case. So... I went to Toronto and I took a course uh, uh, writing um, sitcoms for like four months. My only formal education was a course writing uh, sitcoms. I didn't finish high school and I didn't get college or university. Uh, so I also had that insecurity. I wasn't sure, did I actually know how to write? You know, And certainly when I was, uh, got this book deal with Grove Press and was writing this book, uh, you know, I would submit something and my editor was like, well, Cliff, you got to conform to the Chicago rules of style. And I was like, I don't even know what the fuck that means. <laughs> and why? Yeah. Why do I have to conform to it? Don't I already have the book deal? Isn't it up to me? Like, can't I? Why? Because really in poetry, you're allowed to capitalize whatever you want or the whole thing can be lowercase. Nobody's right. going to ever object. And I still write that way. And in this book, the phrase black is capitalized. And if you go back and look at my mom's Mabley and Pygmy Markham articles, Black is capitalized uh, in reference to black people, black culture, yeah, black wonder. comedian. Yep. And that's against the Chicago rules of style. It's supposed to be lowercase. But I look at it from a political angle. When I was in the second grade, they told me the rule of capitalization was you you uh, uh, capitalize important things, people, place, or, or, or you know, city names, you know. You capitalize something to show that it's important. So I don't I could not understand why would you not capitalize black comedy, black comedians, black culture. Uh, uh, so I did that in my articles. It was the internet. It didn't matter. Yeah. Nobody ever objected to it. And if you read black uh, scholarship, like black history that's written by black professors or histories of slavery, frequently it is capitalized. Mm -hmm. When it's written by white people, it's not. Or if it's written by, you know, people strictly adhering to Chicago rules of style. So... I always believed that. So that was one thing I fought with my publisher, even though it was against the uh, rule book. And I want it. It is capitalized in the book. Nobody's ever mentioned that. Nobody's ever noticed it. Oh, I noticed reading it. But, you know, but nobody's ever said a... anything about it, yeah. you know? And so clearly it's not like uh, an issue you or a problem. You destroy the entire fabric of the, the publishing industry. Yeah, with it, so. but language changes all the time. Yeah. You know, they introduce new words to the dictionary every year. So why, why must the rules of style be that strict? It doesn't make sense to me. I get grammar, but really when it comes down to it, as long as we're able to communicate effectively as long as you know what i'm intending to say and it it processes it and it lands and you get it there's no need for anybody to correct you and say well that's not the way it's pronounced or that's not the way uh it's said clearly that is the way it's said if i said it and you understood it yeah. that's uh that's a successful uh conveyance of language yeah so i i but that comes from my own uh, issues with not having any education, not having any schooling. So I'm not, I wasn't taught that this is the way something has to be. Whereas people go through uh, certain elements of school or writing courses or whatever, they think drilled it has into to them. Be, and, yeah. yeah. Well, yeah, the Woody Allen thing. I mean, he did, I, the joke is he did the one semester of college uh, and got thrown out. I'm not sure if it's true or not. I'm sure you could oh, scholarly right, 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 tell. Right. But, but that autodidact thing, um, it does become a chip on one's shoulder in, in some respects. If you're self-taught, it becomes a, you know, I got to prove that I, I, I know what I'm talking about here. I'm not, you know, going off half cocked when people take courses in, a, a, you know, an area of study as opposed to. I, I get asked all the time, where did you go to school? 
And I'm like, well, what does that mean? Like you're at first grade, kindergarten? Like what is it? Yeah. The, the implication is which university, which college? I even took a meeting, a Hollywood meeting with this guy, some executive. And the way he asked the question, I'll remember how he phrased it. He didn't say, what is your alma mater? But that's what he meant. Yeah. And he was like a Yale skull and crossbones guy who graduated into a position of power at a Hollywood studio. And I couldn't really get, I didn't get what he was asking. I was like, what, what are you asking? My parents are both immigrants. The only thing I knew about college before going to college was Animal House. Right. I literally, there was no tradition in my family. Right. I had no grasp of what this was and what you go there to do. Right. And I didn't really finish with any grasp of that either. But, right. um, but yeah, there, there's a degree that, you know, if you're not part of that establishment, you're not worth anything or you're not, yeah. you know, and that it's really often the opposite. People go to Ivy League schools, graduate into positions of power without any qualifications or yeah. experience. And fail up. Yeah. In Hollywood, it's unbelievable because people who go to Ivy League business school get positions of power within the arts in Hollywood yeah. and deciding what's worthy and what isn't without any talent or ability. There are some very talented artistic executives, but they're not the ones that came out of the Harvard Business School usually, you know. And li literally, there's no space in between them finishing the course and getting that job. They graduate into that job. And I, I find that uh, astounding, you know. So some people get a kick out of it now when they say, where did you go to school? And I said, well, I went to high school in the woods of Canada and I got kicked out uh, at the start of the 12th grade and I never finished and that was that. What did you get kicked out for? I ran for school president and I had written this speech three years earlier. I had this master plan. I had read, <laughs> I had read two biographies of my heroes. I had read a biography of Frank Zappa and a biography of Stan Freeberg. And in both of them, they talked about running for school president with these salacious speeches. The Stan Freeberg talked about how he campaigned. One of his campaign promises was to build glass, glass walls in the uh, girls' uh, locker room. <laughs> And I forget what Frank Zappa's uh, campaign promise was, but they were both like funny and entertaining. Yeah. So in the eighth grade, I was very shy. In retrospect, it was like my first stand-up performance. I was very shy in the eighth grade, so I wrote this speech that I thought was funny. And I, I kept punching it up and revising it over the years. I hid it between my mattresses. By the time it got to uh, uh, 11th or 12th grade, it was time to run for school president. And uh, I had memorized this speech. I had a kid... Uh, um, it was in the gymnasium and I had him cue in the little, um, office there. They had a PA system in the gym and you could press play on a, P on a cassette. And I had the theme from shaft. I had to <laughs> press play on the theme from shaft when they introduced me. And I was like, and I went up there and I, my speech was about how God had created our high school in seven days and what God had done on each day, you know. And I started off talking about the structural problems of the school. On the first day, God said, let there be water fountains where the water tastes like blood. You know? <laughs> and everybody laughed because it was true. And I said, I think on the second day, God said, uh, you know, whatever the structural problems were. And then halfway through the speech, I got into the teachers. On the fourth day, God said, let there be an art teacher who huffs glue in the back room. And the whole crowd went, oh, <laughs> On the fifth day, God said, let there be a drama teacher who used to do softcore pornography. Oh, it was all the rumors. They were all true. Everybody knew these were yeah. true. And it got quite uh, uh, um, quite vicious in the sense that I was really saying some things that should not have been said out loud. I said, uh, let there be an English teacher who was suspended from a school in Vancouver for sexual harassment and then was sent here for punishment. And everybody went, oh, like the student body was losing their minds. And then at the very end, this was 1997, I think. Yeah, maybe 17 or so. Yeah. yeah I said, uh, and so back then, I don't know what high schools are like now. It seems like today high schoolers are very foul mouthed and it doesn't seem to have any consequence. But when I was growing up, you didn't swear in your class or you got kicked out. So I finished off the speech. I said, you know, uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, um, I, unlike my two opponents, and I was running against a jock and a volleyball player, a guy and a girl. I uh, said, unlike my opponents, I cannot promise you anything because high school presidents have no power, none. Don't kid yourself. So I can only promise you one thing and one thing only if elected. If elected school president, I will be the coolest fucking school president Mount Sentinel, the name of school, has ever seen. And then my friend hit play on the shaft theme. I walked off and the crowd rose to their feet and roared like I was a hero, you know. And then I sat down on the little bench 
Somebody else had to go up there and do some announcements. And from way the top of the bleachers was uh, my science teacher, Mr. Olenek. And he started screaming over the student body. We're still sitting there yelling at me, heckling. He goes, that kind of language is not appropriate for this forum. That kind of language is not appropriate for this forum. And oddly enough, or ironically, that was the one teacher, and every school has a teacher like this. He was the one teacher who always swore in class. <laughs> so I yelled back. I went, I learned those words from you. <laughs> and the student body went, oh. <laughs> so it was a very, very small school in the woods of Canada. There was only 400 students. But the final tally was 400 votes to zero to zero. I won every vote. Right. Good. But then I got sent to the principal's office immediately. And as I was walking down the hall, my social studies teacher was pacing and I had made a reference to him about being a, an alcoholic in the speech. <laughs> and he's just like mumbling under his breath, I didn't fight an I.O. Jimma for you to blah, 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 blah. You go into the principal's office. The principal, Mr. Lukov, took off his glasses, starts massaging his face, you know, like the, it just yeah. nonstop massaging his face, doesn't say anything. You know, for about a minute, and then he goes, never in all my years of principling have I ever seen such a disrespectful, disgusting, blah, blah. And then the vice principal came into the office, and he's just red-faced, and he goes, if it was up to me, sir, he wouldn't be coming back. He wouldn't be coming back. If it was up to me, he goes, he won't be. He won't be. He won't be. They left the office, and then every teacher I had made fun of had a chance to come in one-on-one and <laughs> <Berate> confront <laughs> me. So, it, But it was fascinating because... Depending on what subject they taught, it perfectly fit their reaction <laughs> to the speech. So that social studies teacher, you know, was like the war vet and said, you know, I did not fight for your right to be blah, blah, blah. Then uh, my English teacher, who was kind of a cool English teacher, came in. He goes, you son of a bitch. You son of <laughs> He's smiling, shaking his head. You son of a bitch. Tell me this. Did you do that just to get votes or did you do it to make some kind of a statement? <laughs> And I didn't even know the answer to that, but I was like, ah, I don't know, both, I guess. He goes, both, both. Well, you son of a bitch. And then he walked out. <laughs> then my drama teacher, the one who had done softcore porn, the drama teacher comes in, and she was the only one who had a reaction like this. She goes, she closes the door behind her, and she whispers, she goes, Cliff, that was an incredible performance. <laughs> <laughs> and so I won by a landslide, but I got kicked out of school. But in retrospect, it was my first time in front of a big crowd, 400 people. I got huge laughs. And I got a standing ovation at the end. It was my first time, like, really performing. And then about a year and a half later, I moved to Toronto and took that sitcom writing course. And there was a comedian in the class who suggested I try stand-up. And he kind of pushed me into stand-up. Did you uh, send a copy of the book to your old school library or not? No, I didn't. You, you really, you know, you should send just to show that you made good. They won't remember me, I'm sure. I'm sure it's all different I have people. A feeling. That, it's all different people. I, I don't know, man. By now, probably. But. It's less than 20 years. You, you probably still have some animosity. You remember that son of a bitch when he gave that speech? Yeah, you know, yeah, I, yeah. I, you know. But that's that's why I don't have a diploma. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> now, let me ask freak out moments. I, I heard an old or an earlier interview of yours where you mentioned uh, basically accidentally almost ending up on the phone with Steve Martin when you were, yeah. you were starting out with this stuff and being a little starstruck we'll we'll say uh playing cool but holy shit i'm on the phone with steve martin do you have those freak out moments at this point or have you kind of no i have i can't you know i i don't get starstruck i live in los angeles i don't really get starstruck you do get to meet or at least i do you do get to meet everybody or yeah. become friends with everybody so i don't really get starstruck i'm not a fan yeah do you remember having legend moments i'm sure mel brooks was a little holy shit well that's when brooks, i did a but... show with mel brooks yeah. I don't know. Maybe I, maybe I'm just pompous, but well, I don't. That's a given. But, but I don't yeah. feel like I'm a fan. I feel like I'm an equal when I deal with these people because often, uh, especially now that this book is out, if I'm introduced to somebody in comedy, I don't. I have to say my last name because nobody would recognize my face. But if I say my last name nine times out of ten, they go, "Oh yeah, I love your book," or "Oh yeah," blah blah. Like people know who I am in comedy, so that's great. Uh, with Mel, we did a show together, a live show together before this book came out. And I described that evening in the preface to my book. It was a huge deal for me. Like it was also my first time in st on stage in five years. I had not been on stage in five years and here I'm on stage with Mel Brooks. So it was a huge deal for me. It was very special, but I was not freaking out because it was Mel Brooks. I was mostly freaking out because I hadn't been on stage in five years. Uh, in terms of like star struckness or holy shit moments, they're the people you might not expect. So yeah. uh, I only can think of one Listen, time. Roz Chest was Bruce McCall. 
Oh yeah. yeah, yeah. Of all people, she's oh, she's talking about Steve Martin and Scorsese and this one that. But you know, the one who really freaks me out. I'm like sitting at dinner with him, and it's like, holy shit, you're Bruce McCall. I'm like, really? Yeah, it's all that's, about that's what your... they mean to yeah. you. It's so not about your... how famous they are. It's about what they meant to you. So mm. the person that I was starstruck by, I did a live show with George Slaughter, who created Laugh-In, and he brought somebody to the show or invited somebody to the show. And somebody told me he was in the audience, and I went, oh, my God, I got to get a photo with him afterwards, which I've never asked anybody to do a photo with me. And it was uh, Sergio Aragones, or Aragones, the yeah. cartoonist from Mad yeah. Magazine, who did I'm all. I'm hoping the... to meet him this fall. We're supposed to be at a festival together. Oh, so... really? Oh, yeah, yeah. And that's I would. He's one of those guys. I would have the same reaction. Bowing yeah. down. Yeah. Well, I, I told him when I met him, and and for those people who don't know, he did all the silent cartoons in Mad Magazine since the '60s, still to this day. Very distinctive style, big noses. He's known as the fastest cartoonist in the world, and. Everybody loves him. And well, they re- joke that he can't be on Twitter because every one of his drawings has more than 140 characters. Ah, in <laughs> that's great. I love that. I love that. And, and he's very funny. Like his, yeah. his art is funny. His gags are funny. He's much beloved, certainly by the comics community. But I think anybody that ever looked at a Mad Magazine would recognize his art, artwork immediately. And I said to him when I met him that of all the people that have made me laugh, whether it's Mel Brooks or Steve Martin... There's probably nobody that has been making me laugh longer than Sergio Aragones because I could read his material before I knew how to read. There's no words in it. So I was laughing at his stuff when I was three and understanding it, you know. And I can't say that about anybody else. You know, there's people like Steve Martin I've been laughing at since I was six. You know, the Muppets have been laughing at since I was four. But Sergio Aragones, I think, more uh, than anybody else. So I was starstruck by him and I got a photo with him with his giant mustache that he has and uh, yeah he's he, so that was that was a big one for me but no i don't really get nervous uh i think out of experience and pomposity i feel like I, i'm on equal footing with most of these people and fortunately for me certainly in the comedy community uh, i've got respect credibility now and uh and yeah so i don't i don't i don't really have that and and maybe i should i don't know i, I consider it a, a healthy sign Last two questions, and they're they're tied together. Uh, living comedian, you wish you had been able to interview. Ah, uh, well, a few people died while I was working on yeah, this book. Yeah, I, I was wondering about the dead one. Is the the next question dead comic? You you wish you could also get, but well, most of the ones that I didn't get for this book are, are people who died in the process of it. So I have a photo of me with uh, uh, Joan Rivers that somebody took, and it was her and I setting up an appointment to be interviewed for this book, and then she died two weeks later unexpectedly so that didn't happen same with jonathan winters uh, somebody was going to drive me up to his house in santa barbara on a specific date i think it was the end of march and uh it was all set up and then i got a phone call uh, the same week saying cliff uh, jonathan's very sick his uh family's canceling everything so we'll have to try and reschedule and then he died at the end of the week as well uh so though i was remiss to miss those people uh, there's certain other people that did not quite work out who I did talk to briefly, Jerry Lewis and Mort Saul. Fortunately for me, you know, I press record before I phone people, you know, even if I'm setting up. The yeah, you know, legally, that's not cool. But whatever. That's, that's It's uh, not? I don't think so. Uh, it could be a U.S. versus Canadian thing. I think some states you have to tell them they're being recorded. Yeah. I'm not sure how it varies from state to state. So I just assume people know that I'm recording them if I'm going to interview them. But yeah. like with these guys, you know, I still hit record because – Sometimes people, well, well, let's do the interview right now or whatever. You know, you yeah. never know. So. You may as well. Yeah. yeah. So with Mort Saul and Jerry Lewis, uh, Drew Friedman, the illustrator, set me up with Jerry Lewis. He had called him. Jerry said, yes, tell him to call me. Drew phoned me. He said, Jerry says to go ahead and call him. So I called him right away so he wouldn't forget, you know. So I phoned Jerry Lewis. I said, hi, Jerry. This is uh, Cliff Nesteroff. Uh, I think Drew, Drew Friedman told, me, told you that I was going to call. He goes, yes, yes, Cliff. How could I help you? I said, well, I'd like to do... Uh, an interview with you for this book. I never do interviews. I, um, uh, but Drew told you, yeah, I know. Uh, <laughs> well, I, uh, anyways. Oh, then I realized, oh, he's like b- dad jokes. He's trying to be funny, you know. Yeah. So I was like, oh, ha, 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 ha. Well, anyways, I'm going to be in town soon. And uh, I'm wondering what would be a good day to sit down and, and do this interview. No, I never talk to the media anymore. I don't do interviews. I said, well, I'm thinking like, well, why did he tell him to call me <laughs> or call him, you know? And uh, so that was weird. And so I never ended up doing a proper interview with Jerry. 
And then Mort Saul, I phoned and um, phoned him on his cell phone. And he goes, oh, yeah, talk to my assistant. I'll be happy to set something up for you. I said, all right. Now I go to hang up and then I can hear that Mort hasn't hung up. Now, a lot of old people are bad with cell phones. Sure. Yeah. So he didn't hang up. He put it like in his pocket and I could hear his day. <laughs> <laughs> and I couldn't, in good conscience, disconnect. I was recording this. I wanted to see what Mort Saul's day was like. So he's like in like a bagel shop. He's like, yeah, I'll have poppy seed. Yeah, and uh, I'll have a garlic and onion as well. You watched that Neil Patrick Harris on the Tonys last night? Boy, is he sure something, isn't he? I'm like overhearing everything he's saying for, for, for like 45 minutes. So, uh, But I didn't end up getting to interview Mort either. I think he asked for money or something. He and Stan Freeberg asked to be paid for the privilege of uh, being interviewed. And I was like, why? why, why? Nobody else is expecting money. I mean, that seems silly. but uh, So you'll actually see that there's not a great deal of Mort in the book as much as you would expect anyways and it's mostly because i didn't have access to him the people who i had the most access to end up being in the book more than a lot of others and that was not because i think they're more important but they gave me more material you know there's more things to quote from and uh, i'd be happy to rectify that if anybody wondered you know why is mort not in there more it's not that he isn't important it's just i didn't get any anecdotes from him you know and i tried to use as much firsthand material that i procured as possible to make it a fresh original book yeah, rather, rather than, than grabbing mm-hmm. free, yeah. and you do a good job citing that at the beginning also right. explaining how how to differentiate yes the yes pre-done yes, interviews yes. So i was pretty sure that you didn't actually interview groucho i i, I wasn't i did 100%, not but you know i figured out eventually i did not that, i had yeah, lunch with yeah. his grandson just a couple of days ago oddly enough but uh, i did not uh i did not uh interview groucho no yeah. And, you know, Gilbert, who does the great Groucho Gilbert Gottfried's <laughs> impression of the elderly Groucho is one of the funniest things on God's green earth. It's truly hysterical. I, you know, Gilbert Gottfried is maybe the most underrated impressionist in show business. Uh, it's funny. Like, people will talk about Rich Little as an impressionist. They'll talk about Daryl Hammond as an impressionist. Nobody refers to Gilbert Gottfried as an impressionist, I guess because he does all kinds of other things. But... His impressions are unique. They're unlike anybody else's. He does a hilarious impression that's for a very esoteric audience. That's the problem, I think. Yeah. But he does an impression of Hunts Hall talking to Joey Ross. <laughs> and it's, it's Joey Ross going, ooh, ooh. Hunts Hall, oh, oh, ooh, ooh, oh, oh, ooh, ooh. And it's the funniest thing ever if you know who those yeah. two uh, comic actors are. But I think also in Gilbert's case, it's because he's doing impressions of other comics that that, that becomes sort of a, a meta level of... Could of... be. Gilbert invented the Jerry Seinfeld impression. When they were both uh, comedians at the comic strip in the late 70s, Jerry Seinfeld was the MC, and Gilbert was like 16 years old doing stand-up, and he would go up there and impersonate Jerry Seinfeld. He was the first person to do that, what's the deal, who are these people? And nobody would laugh. Nobody in the audience would laugh because nobody knew who Jerry Seinfeld was, you know? It was just for the comics, but now everybody does that impression. But Gilbert invented it. Norm MacDonald also is maybe one of the most underrated impressionists in the business. I, I'm desperate to get him on oh, someday, he, just for the literature side, just for the, the amount of reading he does on that He's a side. very smart man. He, yeah. he, he doesn't have it anymore, but for a while he had a Twitter feed called yeah. Norm, Norm's Book Club. That was all about uh, literature. But yeah, I mean, he's sort of a savant. He's a bit of a genius. And he's interesting that way. There's a lot of guys who play down their intelligence. You know, their character is almost as a dumb guy or an everyman yeah. when in reality he's as sophisticated as anybody in comedy. Mm-hmm. With a huge gambling problem. Not anymore. Not yeah, anymore. You know, I mean, it's still does. Goes but away. It, well, I, I'm sure that's true. Well, it's like being a drug addict. You can be. Uh, You're in recovery. You can be off drugs for 10 years. It just takes one uh, instigating factor to relapse. It's the same with gambling. Addiction's addiction. But as far as I know, he's not uh, gambling. Which, again, comes up again and again throughout the, the book, which is a fantastic book, by the way. Thank I, you. I you know, enjoy the living hell out of it. Again, having read some of your stuff over the years, it was great to see how they get integrated into this larger history of comedy and America, as, as you, you do. Cliff Nesteroff, thanks so much for coming on the Virtual Memories Show. Thank you, Gil. And that was Cliff Nesteroff. His website is classicshowbiz.blogspot.com. And that'll lead you to all sorts of great stuff that Cliff's written over the years. Uh, he'll, it's filled with YouTube 
clips and various scans of old issues of variety and things like that that'll well as you can see they set you down the rabbit hole of of stories about the the history of comedy and the history of showbiz uh really fascinating stuff um it also has a link to the big archive of his essays at wfmu's beware of the blog which is where all of this started and you really really need to pick up cliff's book the comedians drunks Thieves, Scoundrels, and the History of American Comedy from Grove Press. It's available at bookstores everywhere, and I, I just can't recommend it highly enough. It's a fantastic book, so look that one up. Uh, Cliff's name, once again, is K-L-I-P-H. Nesteroff is N-E-S-T-E-R-O-F-F. Also, I pre-ordered Liz Hand's new novel, Hard Light, because I loved her first two Casneri books, and that comes out this week. So if you haven't experienced those yet, uh, get on them. If you've read the first two, go order the third one. Now, after our conversations, I asked Cliff and Liz, so who are you reading? And if you want to get their answers to that, you need to become a supporter of this podcast so you can get access to our monthly show, Fear of a Square Planet. You can do that at patreon.com slash vmspod or at paypal.me slash vmspod. I've got all sorts of goals and goodies in place for supporters of the show, including that special podcast, a patron-only blog, a series of ebooks, and lots of other good stuff. So go to patreon.com slash vmspod and support the art of fine conversation. And if you don't like Patreon, just go to paypal.me slash vmspod and make a donation that way. If you do, you'll get access to the exact same material through fearofasquareplanet.com. Now, special thanks go out to our supporters, Paul W. Jones, Michael Janizek, Fred Kish, Jonathan Kranz, Andrew Mason, and Zach Martin for going over and above in their support of the Virtual Memories show. We've got the full list of show supporters at Chimera Obscura dot com slash vm now as far as expenses go uh this episode was recorded at the home of a friend of mine in new york city last friday while cliff was in town the toll at the george washington was 11 bucks parking was 29 and i was a friday so i ended up hanging around and getting dinner in town so i could avoid sitting in traffic on the drive home to new jersey um dinner actually ran 60 bucks and did not include booze um a really fantastic restaurant but upper east side you know, that's getting out cheap, but I'm not asking for that sort of thing. Anyway, if you want to help defray some of the costs of doing this podcast, visit patreon.com slash vmspod or paypal.me slash vmspod. Our music for this episode is Nothing's Gonna Bring Me Down by David Bayerwald, used with permission from the artist. David's got a reunion project going with his great 80s band, David and David. You can find out more and support that at facebook.com slash David and David Music. And that's it for this week's Virtual Memories show. Thanks so much for listening. Next week's guest will be Fred Kaplan, author of Dark Territory, The Secret History of Cyber War. We haven't recorded it yet, so don't hold it against me if we wind up with a different guest. Until next time, you can subscribe to the show and download past episodes at the iTunes Store. You can also find those episodes and get on our email list at either of our websites, vmspod.com or chimeraobscura.com slash vm. You can follow us on Twitter at vmspod, on Facebook at facebook.com slash virtualmemoriesshow, and at virtualmemoriespodcast.tumblr.com. And if you like this show, please go to iTunes, look up the Virtual Memories Show, and leave a rating and review for this podcast. It'll help us build a bigger audience. Until next time, you've been listening to the Virtual Memories Show. I'm your host, Gil Roth, and you are awesome. Keep it that way. 